All right, well, I'm only gonna take a few minutes. I, it, I mean, obviously the discussions over the course of the last two days have been so incredibly rich and so varied and important that I am humbled by this task of trying to summarize them. Um, I think I introduced myself when I, I asked the question to David um, Price, so I won't do that again. But let me just say that for our center, and I'm co-director, uh, I, I, okay, I will introduce myself a little bit. I've been involved, I counted before this, in about eight different interdisciplinary initiatives at two different universities. I've started three centers or institutes kind of from the ground up um, and been a part of like five or six interdisciplinary minor programs. So I'm editorializing a little bit in this, <laughs> but I'm trying to draw on our discussions um, over the past two days, but I didn't stick to them directly. So one thing that we say in our center, and I think we heard throughout the course of the um, two days, are that students are the glue to multi-inter and transdisciplinary activity. Um, but it, it depends on the support we give them, whether they can be the super glue or the Elmer's kind of school glue variety that doesn't stick very well. And so and that these, and I think that is kind of a good analogy, is that they have the capacity and the desire, but it's up to us to enable them to really make these things stick. Um, and so it puts the burden more on, on us because um, they will be the glue, but what kind of glue they are, I think, matters on the conditions that we give them. And I think these occur at three different levels, micro level, um, meso level, and macro. The micro being kind of the individual biases and predispositions of people, because we are people. The me meso being more of the institutional um, structures and programs we create, and then the macro being kind of this socio-political larger context, economic context, that we don't have a whole lot of control about other than using our voice, which we discussed um, later. So I, um, so these are, this is my, so I'm not going to go through each session and say, you know, what were the lessons, because I want to stop in five minutes, but um, I kind of came up with, a, I tried alliteration, like an English technique, right, a literary. Um, so I tried to use P words, um, and I and I kind of thought about this as a as it's a recipe that where you're adding all these ingredients, and it's not just one ingredient that's important. It's maybe not even a few, but it's almost like a, a master chef. We don't quite know the secret yet, but we know that a combination of these varieties um, or of these ingredients are important for a successful recipe, if you will. But we still haven't found out like that magic, like a, a professional chef does. Um, and so people, practices, places, and predispositions, and there's probably a better word for predispositions, and I will leave that up to the English majors and the communication people, which we need desperately. So people, faculty leaders, persistence, personality, and power, or proximity to power. I think that's kind of a key thing, is that many of these interdisciplinary leaders that we've seen over the course of the two days either are in positions of like vice provost or vi associate vice provost, or they have direct access to them um, due to their stature. Like, you know, Fred, with his dynamic and his NAS Academy membership, and he is a leader in his field, and so he has access to people in power. Um, and so, and, and I, I say this as a compliment, but I also say it as it could be a barrier. Um, who does this marginalize for participation in leadership, okay? Um, so that was one thing that I think came out, but persistence and personality, and we all know in this program that Fred has both, and many other people in the program do, um, but I think that is a key, that we are individuals and personalities matter and persistence matters, and to, so to bring an entomology kind of analogy, you have to be kind of like a pest, an agricultural pest, right? You had to keep flying on the plant of those administrators and flying on the plants of those faculty and make them chew into them a little bit. Right, Fred? <laughs> okay. So, um, so then students also need those same qualities. And the poor things also have to get a degree at the same time. So um, again, but they also need the privilege of resources and probably social position, too. We found out, um, I think it was from Rebecca, that you know, some students in, in, in communities that are underserved will not necessarily know about these programs or even know how to get to graduate school. Um, and so who does this marginalize? And then diversity, we need diverse people because diversity matters from standpoint theory, from perspectives, from better rigor of the science and the intellectual endeavor, right? We, um, there was the nice analogy of, this, of the uh, SNAP program, right? And how do you know what that, how people use that program unless you know people who are using that program? 
um, different standpoints and different cultures, and we need mentors that are diverse to reflect the students that you want. And I, I forget you know, who said these wonderful things, but I know many of you did. So I think that's really important. And I have missed a lot of features of people, but that's sort of like we need the people matter, and I think almost the most. Um, practices matter, collaborative communication methods uh, across disciplines. I liked the idea of blogs that came up. I forget again who mentioned that. I have it written down, don't worry, for the official notes. But, um, you know, the blogs about defining the terms in your field, I thought that was kind of a cool idea. You know, these shared spaces where you can really safely um, explore uh, language. We need respect for different standpoints. We do need to sweat the small stuff. Lunches, gatherings are important. Um, skills, of course, stakeholder engagement and experiences with different sectors is really important. Um, students, it, what's valued in the workshop is leadership training and project management, conflict resolu resolution, but all this depends on student professional financial and emotional support. Um, data for metrics, better metrics, and um, you know, one question is because we are interdisciplinary, do we really need, you know, quantitative metrics or do anecdotes and observation, can that be accepted as data? Um, so then predispositions, which is probably the hardest to ma matter, is the let it go attitude. I think once you get to a certain position in your career, you think we've been doing it this way, and it's sort of like a powerful thing, you know, like, hey, we've been doing it my way for 20 years, but we need to sort of let that go as older faculty and embrace change. Um, we also need to let go our biases and our disciplines and our ways of knowing, and also worldviews. Um, and so then, you know, but then I had the question, what can we do about the macro social political biases and trends? So again, I'm editorializing a little bit. And then institutional change. And I think the barriers here at the institutional level, you've got this will and desire from the faculty and it's like they're running a race and then they have to jump the hurdle and I ran hurdles like in grade school and I was horrible at it. But, um, so, and I think these, these meso level institutional changes are one of the big hurdles you have to get over. Um, but then the second big hurdle, of course, are the macro political trends too. But um, so funding political structures at universities, we have, um, there's a lot of programs here that have tried to embed their interdisciplinary programs in the highest institutional level possible. And I think that's an important thing that you shouldn't get too buried down in the academic weeds of departments. You need to have a foundation in departments and colleges, but it's best that these things kind of float above. Um, that I think Brian mentioned um, that this morning. Um, and then of course the funding programs at NSF are problematic in the sense that they don't, they're, they're great in the sense that it's interdisciplinary natural and social sciences, but they don't embrace the humanities and arts, the direct funding of those programs. They embrace them, but they don't fund them directly. So there are a lot of institutional changes. Um, and then I also think that, and I think this was mentioned a couple times, that structures for continuity are really important once NERTs and IGERTs are, uh, are over. And I do think our GS Center is an example of that, where we, it's, con it's, you know, there's some continuity now for going forward, and we have an institutional home for going forward, and hopefully another NERT in the future. Um, so I know I've missed a ton, but I tried to kind of get it under these four Ps, and I'm sure that Zach and Fred and others will add more to this. Um, incredibly rich discussion. And I just want to end with a few quotes that we heard um, this morning and yesterday. And I didn't get all of the good ones, but I liked the join team optimism that Maggie said. Um, and I loved, of course, I, this is my own bias, stop apologizing for the liberal arts, defend it, and don't back down on the more macro political level. Um, and then we need Renaissance people to address wicked problems. So those are kind of three inspirational quotes that we can um, end with. And that's it. I don't know how much time I took. A little bit more.